I now have the pleasure to introduce myself. Um, I will be, first I'll write down my time, and I'll be speaking on the subject of national identity, a force for sustainable diversity. Now in my introductory remarks, I referred to two types of post postmodern era or postmodernism. One is descriptive. I'll be today I'll be talking about the interpretive type of postmodernism, the theoretical apparatus, the epistemology, epistemological assumptions, um, and elements of the ideology of it. And I'll be critical. <clears throat> Postmodernism rejects grand narratives and claims of absolute or universal truth. Now I'm talking about not postmodern era or times, I'm talking about the, the, theoretical, um, the theoretical and conceptual uh, uh, um, process of multicultural analysis, of, of postmodernist analysis. It rejects grand narratives, these are central ideas of postmodernism and it rejects claims of absolute or universal truth. In this vein, it rejects the bourgeois, elitist culture of the Enlightenment and casts doubt on the universalist claims of Western civilization, such as the scientific and industrial re revolutions. These are problematized. That makes postmodernism a type of irrationalism, strictly speaking, on account of its skepticism towards the vast body of knowledge and logic accumulated by science in the last four centuries. That does not disqualify postmodernism as a way of discussing literature and art, but it raises grave doubts about its usefulness as an epistemology. Linguist Noam Chomsky agrees, ridiculing postmodernism as an indefinable, inchoate body of ideas that contributes little to knowledge. He means scientific knowledge. If Chomsky's view is correct, and postmodernism is rhetorical pyrotechnics, then national identity in the postmodern era would not be very different from what it was in the modern era or the pre-modern era. A quick study of postmodern treatments of the nation of national identity supports Chomsky's criticism. Consider two well-known studies of nationalism, Richard Kearney's postmodernist critique of Irish nationalism and Mira Nanda's pro-science critique of Hindu nationalism in India. Kearney sees nationalism as another example of the centralized power structures criticized by postmodernists, totalitarianism, colonialism, and imperialism. So he adds nationalism to those other isms. They are all meant to share the same invidious features of uni-perspective centralization with uniform identity. The postmodern preference for decentralized power is held to undermine the nation state because the latter imposes a centralized monopoly of the use of a legitimate violence within its territory. So here we have a, a classic postmodern, postmodernist criticism of the, the uh, modern nation state. Now, Nanda's critique of Hindu nationalism reaches the opposite conclusion. She argues, and she takes an anti-national position, this makes it interesting. She argues that postmodernism has undermined the authority of science in India, freeing traditional nationalists from the constraints of rational discourse and universal values. Religious myths gained leg legitimacy as a way of understanding equal to science because science is seen as just another ideology, another set of propositions. If science is just another ideology, another point of view, who is to say that parochial prejudice is not as valid as anthropological findings of the unity of mankind? <clears throat> Which is true? Does postmodernism subvert the nation state or empower it? As well as true analysis, there is also the realm of values. Is postmodernism progressive or reactionary, if I might use those modernist labels? A postmodern critique of the nation and of national identity is that national boundaries hinder communication, which is true. 
but misses the point that in doing so they preserve differences and therefore diversity. In that case, the postmodernist critique of national identity puts it on the side of homogenizing globalism, ironically, back with capitalist un uniformity and centralism. The existence of independent nation states allows the perpetuation of what the Austrian ethologist Irenaeus Abelabersfeld has called international multiculturalism, which he considered to be sustainable as opposed to intrastate multiculturalism. In its anti-national bias, postmodernism might be, in effect, an ideology that promotes the homogenization of human culture. This is, I'm putting this as, a, as an idea. Another analytical problem with the postmodern critique is that the national impulse has ancient, not modern, roots. As humanity's evolved human nature is slow to change and has origins outside the modern era, critiques of modernism are not obviously sufficient to, under to understand the emotional content of nationalism. That limits postmodernism's relevance. Doesn't end it, but it limits its relevance to solving global challenges related to group identity. Now in this talk I shall be assuming that national identity is in the postmodern era very much what it was in the modern era, in the pre-modern era um, as well. It's a cultural resource for many purposes, for good or for ill, including sustaining human diversity and liberty, which I take to be humanitarian values and therefore relevant to this, to this forum. Now I was going to discuss, and in my paper I discuss I, and compare crises of national identity in two societies, Australia and Estonia. But uh, time limits me to Australia and seeing it's my country, I'll remain with that example and end with it. Over the last four decades, Australia's historical national identity has been contested by those who seek to replace it with a civic, multicultural orientation. The initiative was, is not, was not from the people, but it was a top-down affair based in powerful institutions in education and the media. The process is both a response to and preparation for further diversification through immigration. According to the civic theory, Australia's national identity consists of such qualities as a set of values follow, egalitarianism, fairness, stoicism, and mateship or friendship. But there's a problem. These, these are common attributes that distinguish no society in particular, unlike Australia's historically evolved identity beginning with British origins, institutions, and core ethnic group. <clears throat> There is much evidence that Australia's historical national identity is being contested. An example is the previous Labor government. We have a new government in Australia just recently. The previous Labor government attempted to introduce a compulsory national civics curriculum for high schools that would teach children nothing of the country's Anglo-Celtic history. Neither did it celebrate or even acknowledge the society's British consciousness, its in other words, its previous sense of nationhood for most of its existence. Instead, the curriculum advances a world historical perspective which emphasizes indigenous culture, Asian geography, and environmental sustainability, all, all fine values, but hardly descriptive of Australia's national identity. Australia's own English and European political traditions are not mentioned in the curriculum. Neither is the role of Christianity, Australia's ancestral religion. The multicultural establishments of many Western societies with high levels of immigration, Australia, Canada, the United States and Britain and others, insist that national identity is defined by citizenship. Now this point was mentioned previously um, by a professor. Citizenship is a key variable. That's a legal status. It's a legal status with a gloss of prescribed ideals but the people retain their original ethno-cultural identities and religious identities. This is part of the process described earlier in which the establishment seeks to accommodate or facilitate ethnic diversification. However, too rapid diversification risks division as solidarity tends to, have, tend to degrade cohesion. Diversity itself, as distinct from the particular identities it contains, has never proven itself as a functioning national identity that unites. 
I think I have a, just two or three minutes left, about three minutes left. On the contrary, diversity and the multicultural doctrine legitimizing it undermines consensus on identity by hindering assimilation or integration. Multiculturalism does so by encouraging minorities to retain their ancestral languages and cultures. It politicizes ethnic divisions by offering re rewards to minorities that organize along ethnic lines and against the expression of majority ethnic consciousness. That is a type of multiculturalism. There are several types I'm aware of, but this is the one that we have in Australia. Studies of ethno-cultural conflict find a major role for intrastate diversity. Between 1932 and 2011, that means now, that's an 80-year period, ethno-cultural diversity accounted for between 21% and 66% of the variance in communal conflict. Ethno-cultural conflict is usually based on fragmented identities within states. This was the topic of my uh, speech last year at the forum. And so I finish on this point. So it is regrettable that genuine historically grounded and binding national identities such as that which developed in Australia are under assault. The humanitarian implications are clear. Domestic peace is not the only public good that can be lost. Also at stake are diversity at the global level together with local autonomy. National identity, sheltered by the power and authority of the state, is a proven way to prevent or at least slow down globalization from degrading human cultural diversity. It blunts, it blunts the trend towards homogeneity and hegemony of empires, political and economic. Thanks very much for your, for your attention.